Hey everyone, uh, thank you and uh, welcome to our uh, weekly research seminar. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Yi Chung Chung. I am the academic program manager at the Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center here in Newport, Oregon. Uh, and I will be your host for today's talk. Uh, Renee Fowler, not Renee, Taylor uh, will be our hybrid support today. Uh, please let me know if you are having any, uh, uh, please let them know if you're having any technical issues so she can assist or let those of us on site know uh, through the chat. Uh, for those of you online, we have your mics, cameras, and screen share uh, off, but please ask, uh, ask any questions you might have using uh, the chat at any time, and we'll answer any questions at the end of this talk. If you put a question in chat, um, uh, Taylor will read it out for everyone. Uh, you're welcome to raise your digital hand at the end of today's talk. Uh, and uh, and uh, Taylor will be letting uh, you know when it's your turn and will help to unmute your mic. Uh, if you have not already, please make sure you sign in uh, because that helps us get cookies. Uh, and we will handling questions today at the end of the talk. Again, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring you this mic. Uh, you must have a mic to ask a question so those online can hear. This is a hybrid seminar. Uh, we are also recording this event and it will be posted on the HMSC past seminar page in a few days, uh, which uh, Taylor will put the link uh, in the chat, um, hmsc.oregonstate.edu uh, forward slash past seminars. A couple of short announcements. Uh, next week's seminar uh, on May 19th, Thursday, uh, Sam Bedgood, a postdoc scholar uh, with the Department of Integrative Biology at OSU, will talk about finding a place for sea anemones and their algal symbionts in the rocky intertidal food web, trophic and non-trophic interactions. Uh, join us on site or online. Another uh, special seminar that uh, will be happening is uh, we have a visiting um, scholar from the University of Aruba uh, who will be giving it a lunchtime seminar uh, in the library seminar at 12 on Thursday. Now you're welcome to bring your lunch. Uh, and it's entitled Ecosystem Stressors and Marine Conservation Efforts in Small Island States, ABC Islands, Aruba, Bonaire, and Curacao. The three westernmost islands of the Leeward Antilles and the Caribbean Sea uh, through the Sustainable Island Systems through STEM, SYSTEM through the University of Aruba, uh, Dr. Eric Meitz is a researcher and educator and manager at that university who's actually coming to visit and will be giving that talk on site uh, on, at 12. Uh, finally, our HMSC Science on Tap is also on Thursday night that evening uh, at 6 p.m. So it's just tons of seminars. Uh, Scott Baker with the Cetacean Conservation and Genomics Lab and the Associate Director of the Marine Mammal Institute here at Hatfield, uh, we'll be talking about a return to the epicenter of Antarctic whaling, South Georgia Island. This event will be on site and online with food and drink available for sale starting at five o'clock. Sounds like it's going to be a real great party on Thursday, guys. Uh, if you need info or login details for this or any of our events, please log on to the HMSC homepage and scroll to the bottom of the calendar uh, of events with all the details. All right, finally, for today, let me tell you a little more about our speaker today. Uh, Rebecca Mostow is a PhD candidate at Oregon State University, where she is advised by Dr. Sally Hacker. Rebecca's research on a novel hybrid zone between the non-native beach grasses, Amo, uh, Amophila arenaria and A. brevilagulata uh, has earned her awards and funding from the National Science Foundation, the Washington Native Plant Society, the Hatfield Marine Science Center, and the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology. She received a BS in biology from Oberlin College in 2013, where she completed a senior project on desert plant systematics. Before starting her graduate degree, Rebecca conducted research and taught at Port Townsend uh, Marine Science Center, the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge, and the Bureau of Land Management in Carson City District. Uh, Rebecca, thank you for being here with us. The floor is yours. Um, thanks for that great introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, 
I'm really excited to be here with you all today to talk about a part of the dissertation work that I'm doing at Oregon State University. Well, I should have thought about how far this way and how far this way I can go. I'll stay here. Um, I am studying beach grasses here at OSU, and today I'm going to present this talk titled Like Watching Grass Grow, Impacts of a Newly Discovered Hybrid Beach Grass on Plant Species Interactions and Dune Building Potential. So uh, this is, in fact, an index of grass puns, but it's also the outline of what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to start my talk by talking about intentional introductions of ecosystem engineering plants in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I'm calling that section, the grass is always greener. Then we'll move on to the next section, the botany of desire. We're going to talk about hybridization in those non-native plants in the Pacific Northwest. Then we'll move on to um, blades are drawn or a common garden species interaction experiment that happened right out here at the Hatfield Marine Science Center. And then we'll move on to the last section, which is harnessing the power of community engagement. That's you all um, to map uh, this novel hybrid invader. So that's grassroots science. Okay, we're gonna start the talk with some introductions and we'll start with me. So I'm Rebecca, um, I'm a PhD candidate at OSU. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, so these coastal systems are really close to my heart. Um, I had to move all the way out to Ohio to study the desert, and then I eventually ended up back here on the coast where I worked at the Port Townsend Marine Science Center and spent a lot of my time with my head in fish tanks like this. Um, but I also got introduced in Port Townsend to this weird invasive perennial grass that was growing out there. I got a little obsessed with it and I convinced people to pull it like a weed with me. And that's that picture of me in the red jacket there. Um, yeah, and I decided it was time for me to go to grad school and start studying invasion ecology. And another really important character in this story is Dr. Sally Hacker, who is a coastal community ecologist at Oregon State University. She is an incredible scientist who studies rocky intertidal systems, seagrass systems, and started studying the dunes of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and Sally is my advisor, and so I'm going to do no jokes about her. Uh, and then the other really important characters are, I just always like to acknowledge that science is a team sport and there are tons of people who have been involved with this research with me. I'm really lucky to have had such a big and fun research group. Um, these people are undergrads at Oregon State. They are people who work for the federal government, for tribal governments. They are professors and postdocs from across the country. Um, and yeah, I'm really grateful to have worked with all of them. A few people to point out um, are Peter Ruggiero, who's here in this picture. So this is Peter, he's another professor at Oregon State. Anytime you hear me saying anything about the shape of the dunes, the relationship between the, the plants that grow in the dunes and the shape of the dunes, that's work that came out of collaborations between Sally's lab and Peter's lab. And then another really important person is Felipe Barreto, who's down here. He's another professor in integrative biology at Oregon State. Um, Anytime you hear me say anything about genetics, genomics, anything like that, that's work that's coming out of collaborations with Felipe's lab. Uh, and this is an amazing poster for a blockbuster movie that came out recently that my lab mate, Risa Askaruth, who is here and I'm gonna keep talking about, um, made for our lab. Uh, this is Sally saying, unstudied dunes are the mind killer. I'm very lucky to have an amazing lab group to study uh, these sandy ecosystems with. Okay, so let's get to it. We're gonna start talking about changes that have happened on the Pacific Northwest coast over time. And we're gonna talk about the way that this ecosystem has changed really dramatically as a consequence of Euro-American colonization of this coastline. And so I think it's really important to start by saying that there is another really important consequence of that colonization. And that was the forcible and violent removal of the native people from this coastline. So the research I'm going to talk about was conducted from around southern Washington into northern Oregon, and those are the traditional homelands of the Chinook, Quinault, Lower Chehalis, Willapa, Clatsop, Lower Chinook, Tillamook, Celeste, and Nestucca peoples. And the living descendants of these peoples are parts of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians, the Confederated Tribes of the Chehalis Reservation, and the Chinook Nation who were untreated when they were forcibly removed from their land. And so they actually are not federally recognized and they're still seeking that recognition from our government. 
So that is like the really human toll of this Euro-American colonization. Um, and for the rest of the talk, we're gonna think about the sort of ecological impacts of that. So this is the native state of the Pacific Northwest coastal dune. It's this really sort of dynamic shifting sand environment. That black and white picture in the background is these low rolling hummocky dunes. They're sparsely vegetated, but vegetated with a diversity of plants. I'm showing just some of our beautiful native plants that grow out there. And it's a, yeah, a super dynamic, constantly changing system as the sand blows around and the hummocks move around. Um, and shakelis is the lower shahalis word for shifting sand. Um, and shakelis, that word, the transliteration is shahalis. And so the, there are place names that are shifting sand, right? There are people, the names of groups of people that are shifting sand. This was a central part of the coastline for a long time. However, in the early 1900s, European Americans started to settle in Oregon and Washington, and the shifting sands became a huge problem, right? If you start to build hard infrastructure on a landscape that's constantly changing, you run into a problem really quickly. So the shifting sand environment became a problem and people introduced beach grasses in order to stabilize the sand. And these beach grasses did just that. They stabilized the sand and they spread outside of the areas where they were intentionally introduced and built these tall linear dunes that are super densely vegetated and super stable. And so this is what the dunes look like if you go out to, you know, just South Beach right here, you know, a couple miles away, a mile away. Um, and this is what the dunes look like pretty much up and down the Oregon and Washington coasts now. And just to give you a sense of the scale of that change, here I have sort of um, bird's eye view pictures of Pacific City, Oregon. So um, this is about the furthest south town that we'll talk about in the talk today. But on one side, we have these sort of pre or early beach grass introduction pictures where you can see a lot of white, open, shifting sand. And then on the other side, you can see lots of green, stable, linear dunes. So this is the scale of the change that's happened. And the other thing to notice is that not only is our coastline densely vegetated, it's also densely populated. So the amount of human development that's happening behind the dunes, that would not be possible without the beach grasses and their sort of introduction and sand stabilization. So there have been these positive consequences of beach grass introduction, right? They increase coastal protection by basically building almost like a green, almost like a living seawall in front of these coastal communities that absorb storm surge, right? So they increase coastal protection and they increase sand stability. They hold the sand in place. But there have also been negative consequences of this beach grass introduction. So the beach grasses, they outcompete our native plants and decrease plant species richness. And they also decrease the habitat for native birds and some animals. And so they've contributed to the declines of the Western snowy plover. I'm also showing um, our state listed sand verbena, um, the plant there. So there's these, there's these trade off consequences of introduction of beach grass, negative effects on biodiversity, but sort of positive effects for human development. So, so far I've been saying beach grasses, right? Um, but in fact, there are two species of beach grasses that were intentionally introduced. One of them is Amophila arenaria and it's European beach grass. And the other is Amophila brevilegulata, American beach grass. And these two species um, were introduced around the same time, but they have differential effects on dune morphology, so the shape of the dunes, coastal protection and biodiversity. The other thing to note here is that Amophila arenaria, the European beach grass, was introduced first and sort of spread up and down the coast. Um, but now it's mostly dominant in Oregon and, and California. And Amophila brevilegulata, the American beach grass, it was introduced later and it is mostly dominant in Washington. But they overlap, they both occur in Southern Oregon, sorry, Northern Oregon and Southern Washington. So for the next part of the talk, we're just gonna zoom in on the differences between these two species. Okay, Amophila arenaria is our European beach grass, invasive in Oregon and Washington, but native to Western Europe. And then Amophila brevilegulata is American beach grass, native to the US East Coast and the Midwest. Actually, if you go to the dunes on the Great Lakes, this is the grass that's growing out there and also invasive in Oregon. 
And these similar, these um, closely related plants are pretty morphologically similar. You know, you look at them, they look pretty similar. They like to grow on sand. They grow with these underground stems called rhizomes. So they put these stems out underground and then put new um, tillers, new vegetative stems up. And so they're able to spread sort of asexually by spreading with these underground stems along the dunes. The other thing to notice is just that um, I'm going to keep using these Latin names, Amophila arenaria and Amophila brevilligulata. And I know that if you're not familiar with them, they can feel a little bit like alphabet soupy. Um, but the reason I'm going to do it is because the common names for these species are actually really confusing. We have a native grass that the common name is extremely similar to American beach grass, it's American dune grass, and it just causes way too many problems when I use the common name. So I'm sorry, but these are the Latin names, and um, I'm also going to keep the color coding the same. So Amophila arenaria will be red for the rest of the talk. And Amophila brevilligulata will be blue for the rest of the talk, and I hope that that is a little bit helpful. So these two species look sort of, they look similar from the outside, and there's one character trait that we can use to identify them that's really helpful for identifying the grasses in the field, and that is the length of the ligule. So the ligule is just this thin little piece of tissue at the intersection of the leaf blade and the stem. And in Amophila arenaria, it's really long and pointy. And in Amophila brevilligulata, it's really short and flat. If you're thinking in your Latin, right, you might notice that that um, specific epithet, brevi ligulata, is just short liguled in Latin. So there we go. Um, and the way people I tell people to like remember where to look is that the ligule is the armpit hair of the grass. So if you imagine that the grass is like standing with its leaves up, you should look at the armpit of the grass and that's where you're gonna find the ligule, this membranous tissue, um, and you should be able to identify which species it is from that. Okay, so that's sort of the look, the, you know, that's how you might tell these two species apart, but how do they impact the dunes? Dunes dominated by Amophila arenaria tend to be taller and steeper than those dominated by Amophila brevilligulata, and that is because of this positive feedback loop between grass growth and sand deposition. So Amophila arenaria grows more densely, and because of that, it builds these taller, steeper dunes. And Amophila arenaria dunes also tend to have greater plant species richness. So I mentioned that these two grasses co-occur in Northern Oregon and Southern Washington. And we're gonna sort of zoom in on that area for the rest of the talk and think about this area where we have both of these two species growing together on the dunes. And it was on these beaches actually in Southern Washington in 2012 when a lab mate of mine stumbled upon a plant that like didn't fit the story that I've just told you, right? It didn't, it looked a little bit like one species and a little bit like the other species. It was flowering when nothing else was flowering on the dunes. And he started to look around and he actually found this weird looking plant at three more sites, so at four total sites in Washington and Oregon. And he said to himself, is this a beach grass hybrid? Is that what's going on here? So that question, is this a beach grass hybrid? That actually ended up being the like kind of driving question of my dissertation. It's what I've been thinking about for many years now. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been an incredible and generative question to say the least. Um, so this weird plant that he saw, it looked like this. So we have Amophila brevilligulata, the American beach grass, right here in this photo, it's the low part of the dune. Oh, I keep pointing and you all can't see. Oh, no one even making sad blank faces at me. <laughs> no one in the audience here knows what Peter Ruggiero looks like. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, but it's okay. So here we go. Amophila brevilligulata is the lower part of the dune down here. That's one of our parent species. And then Amophila arenaria is the grass that's up here on the top, sort of this is the crest of the dune, the top of the dune. And then this weird little hummock here, this is um, what we thought was like maybe a hybrid, weird looking plant out on the dunes. Another notable thing about this weird looking plant is that it had an intermediate length ligule. So Amophila brevilligulata, right? Short liguled, arenaria with the long ligule, and then the hybrid right there in the middle. So we looked at this plant and thought, could this be a hybrid of the two species? Before we get too deep, um, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page about what hybridiz hybridization is. So a hybrid 
is the offspring of parents from two different species. So not this, right? But this. Uh, a mule is a cross, is the offspring of a horse and a donkey. A liger is the offspring of a lion and a tiger. But this is actually happens in plants a lot more often than it happens in animals. So some you might see, some hybrids you might see in the grocery store are like a pluot, a tangelo. Um, but all of these are artificial hybrids, right? These are hybrids intentionally produced by people. And actually hybridization happens in the wild a lot, like a lot more than I really realized before I was studying hybridization. And I think a lot more than is in our sort of general consciousness. Um, hybridization happens in, in animals, but it's much more common in plants. Um, and it seems to be much, much more common in grasses compared to plants in general. And interestingly, hybridization in plants especially, and in invasive plants especially, especially, hybridization can be a driver of evolutionary change. Um, when we look back at the evolutionary history of plants, we see these moments of hybridization as sort of explosions in adaptation. And so wild hybridization, especially in plants, especially in invasive plants, is something we should keep a close eye on because it might be a driver of rapid adaptation to novel environments. So that's why we care. So this question, is this a hybrid? I'm gonna quickly summarize a few of the little pieces of evidence that we have about this um, plant. The first thing that I did was I looked at the morphology of it. So we collected hundreds of plants, measured a suite of traits from those plants. Some of those traits are important for identifying the plant. So like our ligule length that's up there, right? Um, the leaf width that's up there. Those are just traits that we're using to identify the plants in the field. But then some of the traits I measured are important for that dune building potential. So we looked at the density of the plants. We looked at the height of the plants. And what I found is that the hybrid was taller than either parent species. The next piece of evidence I looked at was the genome size. So I worked in the lab of Dr. Ryan Contreras here at Oregon State, um, and we estimated the genome size of the parent species and of the hybrid. And what we found is that the hybrid has an almost exactly intermediate genome size when compared to the two parents, which is really good evidence that what we're looking at is an organism that has half of its genome from one of these parents and half of its genome from the other. And the last thing I did was um, some SNP genotyping. And so this is just a quick cluster plot of that SNP genotyping showing that the clustering algorithm thinks that all of the individuals for, of Ammophila brevilligulata belong in the blue group, all of the Ammophila arenaria individuals belong in the red group, and all of the hybrid individuals, each individual belongs half in the blue group and half in the red group. So we put all this together and we said, yes, all of this evidence together, this is in fact a hybrid beach grass that we're finding out on the coast. And we published this in Ecosphere last year. So that discovery, um, as many good discoveries do, led to a lot more questions, right? So here are the three sort of structuring questions that we as a lab are using to investigate this hybrid. Um, the first question is about how abundant is the hybrid beach grass and what are its range limits? So this is a question about just how much of the hybrid is out there and where is it? Um, the second question is what are the potential consequences of the hybrid beach grass to the parent species? And we have sort of two parts of that question. What are the evolutionary effects of the hybrid on its parent species? What are the genetic effects? And then what are the ecological effects of the hybrid species? Um, so the genetic effects, we might see that the hybrid is speciating. We might see that it's backcrossing, basically a hybrid individual reproducing sexually with the parent species, producing more of like a hybrid swarm. Or we might see through that backcrossing that the hybrid is facilitating gene flow between the parent species. So that's this big question about the evolution, the genetics, population genetics of the, this group of organisms. And then the next sort of sub question is what are the effects of the hybrid on the ecology of the parent species? So how does the hybrid's growth and morphology differ from its parents? And how might it be interacting? Is it facilitating its parents? Is it competing with its parents? What's going on there? And then the third question is sort of the most zoomed out of these. And it's asking, what are the effects of this hybrid on the ecosystem as a whole? So how will the hybrid of beach grass affect dune shape, carbon sequestration, coastal protection, these like big ecosystem service type questions. 
So briefly, I'm going to talk about this first question, the abundance of the hybrid and the range limit. Um, I'm going to talk about it because I think it's really motivating for the rest of the talk. And then we'll dive into this second question that's sort of the meat of my dissertation work. So I told you before that there were four known sites where the hybrid had been found, um, three up in Washington and one down in Oregon. This is what our map of the hybrid looked like when I joined the lab in 2016. Um, but I joined the lab and my incredible lab mate, Risa Askaruth joined the lab who actually made this poster and made this beautiful map figure. Um, and between our sort of collective searching on the dune, we've now identified 117 patches of this hybrid beach grass in Oregon and Washington. Then the range now goes from Ocean Shores, Washington, all the way down to Pacific City, Oregon. Um, so the hybrid is much more abundant than we originally anticipated or expected. And I think you can say this is more than just like a scientific curiosity of like, oh, let's study hybridization, like how interesting and fun. It's like actually there's a lot of the hybrid out on the dunes and we need to understand what its impact on the dune ecosystem might be. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to zoom in on the second bullet point of question two. So question two is really the meat of my dissertation. And today we're going to talk about the ecological effects of the hybrid on its parent species. And to understand that, I installed a growth and species interaction experiment here at the Marine Science Center. Uh, this is what it looks like. You might remember it from the entire pandemic. Um, and the goals of this project were to compare the growth rate and morphology of the hybrid beach grass to its parent. So we're wondering, does it look different? Does it grow different than the parent species? The second goal was to determine the two-way species interactions between the hybrid and the parent species. So again, are, is it competing with its parents? Is it facilitating its parents? And then the third goal is to project the effects of species interactions on population dynamics of the hybrid and its parent species. So that question is like, if the hybrid is competing with its parents, what are the long-term consequences of that? Is there some stable equilibrium that it's going to go to, or is it going to outcompete its parents over time? What's going to happen? So to meet all of those goals, this is how I set up the experiment. I had these plastic bags filled with sand, and then I planted different combinations of plants in those bags that I collected from Sunset Beach, all plants collected from the same place. And we had different treatments of density, so the number of plants planted, and of plant combinations, so which plants were in each bag. So we had high density monocultures of just one species growing by itself, low density monocultures, and then each of these two way interactions, um, one plant growing with another plant. And so this is what it looked like out in the wild. There were nine treatments and six replicate blocks. And that's me. Uh, and this is March 2020 when we installed the experiment the day before the governor's stay at home order. Um, and this is sort of the growth over time. So on one side, we have March 2020 showing our sort of scraggly looking plants in their bags. And then on the other side, October 2021. So that's 18 months or two full growing seasons, like a full spring, two full springs and summers growing in this experiment. Um, and I returned every single month to the experiment to add sand to the bags because it turns out dune grasses need sand deposition to grow because they're beach plants. Um, so I returned to add sand and then I would also count the number of stems in each bag every time that I came back. So in October 2020, we returned to the experimental site and we were ready to pull these plants out of the bags and figure out what had happened, what was sort of the results of this experiment. And so what I did was I cut open all of the bags and was ready basically to pull these plants out like they were carrots that I was harvesting in my garden. Um, and I quickly discovered that it was going to be nothing like harvesting carrots and it was gonna be a lot more like trying to get gum out of your hair. Uh, the plants were completely root bound in these bags, like they had filled every square centimeter of sand with roots and rhizomes, those underground stems. And so it ended up taking a combined effort of 12 incredible volunteers, who I'm so grateful for, um, over 10 days 
to take apart this experiment and we basically washed all of the sand off of it um, because we really wanted to preserve the below ground biomass, all of these roots and rhizomes underground. So at the end of these long processes, we would have these plants that had big root mass and a bunch of stems sticking out. And then we took those plants back to the lab in Corvallis and dried them at room temperature. And then I started processing the samples. So we took the bags that were interaction treatments that had two different species in them. And I pulled apart the two different species, kind of trying to carefully de-entangle them from one another. And then um, I separated out the above ground biomass and the below ground biomass, counted the total number of stems, and we measured a suite of traits on the plants about their morphology. So how long the stems were, how wide the leaf blades were, how wide the rhizomes were, the length of the entire rhizome, ton of different measurements on these plants. So we're going to transition into the results. I'm going to sort of reveal what happened now. So to remind you, here are our goals. And we're going to start by thinking about this first goal, comparing the growth rate and morphology of the hybrid beechgrass to its parent. Um, and the reason that this goal is so important to us is I told you that these beech grasses, the shape that the grasses grow affects the shape of the dunes, right? But then also these plants are morphologically plastic. Basically, they respond to their environmental conditions. Their, their growth form changes based on their environmental conditions. So it was really important to us to measure their morphology in a controlled environment when they were all experiencing the same environment. So the first figure I'm going to show are density data over time. So our x-axis is time and the y-axis is the stem density. This is from my surveys of the experiment every month when I went to deposit sand. And here I have in blue Amophila brevilligulata, AMBR, right? And we can see basically Amophila brevilligulata started at this low stem density, slowly increased over time, and then had a pretty big increase in the like April, May 2020, sort of 2021. So sort of early spring season of the second year. I'm going to layer on now Amophila arenaria growth over time. Um, so the things I want you to notice are that they start at really similar stem densities and they end at really similar stem densities. But the two different species don't get there in the same way, right? Amophila arenaria actually sees its highest growth in the summer and sort of late summer months. And so we see high growth in the July, August range of both years for Amophila arenaria. But interestingly, I ended up feeling really glad that we gave it 18 full months, right? Because if I had ended the experiment after a year, we would not have seen sort of the full story play out for this interaction. And so now I'll add the hybrid. Now would be a great time to gasp. Uh, the hybrid ended up having much higher stem density overall in these monoculture treatments. Um, and the other important thing to point out, right, is that again, all three species start with really similar stem density. And then I think what I see when I look at this figure is that any time either of the parent species is increasing in growth, the hybrid is increasing, right? So any time um, either of the parent species has sort of a positive slope on its stem density line, the hybrid does too. Uh, I, yeah, this was one of those plots that I made and I, did, I didn't believe that I had coded it correctly when I looked at it at first. So big takeaway, the hybrid grows at a higher stem density than either parent species. Now we're gonna zoom in just on that last time point. So let's think about what do the plants look like in October when we pull the experiment. So we zoom in on the last time point and I'm gonna show these plots where we have the species down on the x-axis and then a trait that we measured on the y-axis. So this is total biomass. I'm showing you a picture of like what that looks like, right? The whole plant that was in the bag together in kilograms. Um, and then the different boxes that we're gonna show and the, the sort of colors are the different treatments, right? So these, I'm only showing the monoculture treatments, just plants growing by themselves. And the big takeaway here is that the hybrid has a much higher biomass than either parent species. And it's significantly higher across our treatments. Okay, now I'm going to layer on the biomass of these species when they were in competition. 
So think for a second to yourself, my, some of my by 450 students are here. So this is a like exercise. Think for yourself, okay, if there was no competition, what would the biomass of, let's say, Ammophila arenaria be when it was grown in an interaction treatment with another species? I won't call you out, just think in your head. There's no competition. I'm gonna compare it to when it was growing in monoculture. I would expect that there would be no difference in the biomass between when it's grown by itself and when it's grown in the interaction treatment. However, it turns out there's really strong competition between each combination of these species. So every interaction that we look at growing in competition always decreases the biomass of all three of these taxa, regardless of what combination we put them in. Now, you might think, you might ask yourself, okay, so there's negative, there's competition happening across the board, but what is the, is there any difference in the magnitude of the effect, right? Is one of these species competing harder with the other species? And that's what we're gonna get into next. Um, you might be able to see a little bit of a spoiler for what's to come in this biomass figure. If you think about, okay, what's the magnitude of the effect of growing with the hybrid versus growing with say, Ammophila arenaria on Ammophila brevilligulata. So I'll leave that there, think in your head, um, I'll spoil it in a second. So the big takeaway here is that the hybrid grows more densely and at a higher biomass than the parent species. These are findings with significant consequences for the shape of Oregon coast dunes. The second goal is to determine these two-way species interactions between the hybrid and its parent. So that's what we're gonna dive into now. And the way that I'm measuring um, species interaction is with a relative interaction index. This is a way of comparing the biomass to develop an interaction index. The big thing that you need to know before you look at this is just that if the number is negative, that means we have competition. And if the number is positive, it means there's facilitation. And the way you can read this table is from left to right, the effect of Ammophila arenaria, Ammophila brevilligulata, and the hybrid on top to bottom, Ammophila arenaria, blah, 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 down like that. So it's going to be a matrix of values. And here they are. So the first thing to notice and that I spoiled already, right, is that every interaction is negative. We're seeing competition between all of these species. And then the next thing to notice is that there's one sort of standout competitor, and that is the effect of the hybrid on Ammophila brevilligulata. That's the greatest interaction, the largest interaction that I measured in this experiment. So seeing that interaction, you might wonder, like, what is the mechanism of that effect? So we know that the hybrid is competing with Ammophila brevilligulata and that there's competition happening kind of across the board. We might wonder sort of what's the mechanism of this effect. And so this is why we measured so many of those sort of smaller morphological characters. I'm just going to show you a couple that really stand out in the analysis. But here, once again, we have our species on the x-axis colored by what treatment they're in. And then on the y-axis, we have um, the different uh, morphological characters that we measured. So on the top, we have primary tiller length and on the bottom, this sort of leaf area measurement. That's just a combination of variables to measure sort of how much photosynthetic area does a plant have. And the thing to note here is that when Ammophila brevilligulata is grown in competition with the hybrid or with Ammophila arenaria, it has a significantly decreased tiller length so that means that when it's competing with these other plants, it doesn't grow as tall. And when Ammophila arenaria is growing with the hybrid, it has a significantly smaller leaf area index. So it has less photosynthetic area when it's forced to compete with the hybrid. So we're seeing some of these sort of morphological effects of this competition. And the big takeaway here is we looked at these two-way interactions, we found that there's competition happening in all of these interactions, in all of these treatments, and the hybrid is competing with its parents and is especially competitive against Ammophila brevilligulata. Okay, we're gonna move on to this last sort of goal of the project, which is to project the effects of species interactions on popula population dynamics of the hybrid and its parent species. So what's gonna happen? Your turn. 
And the way that I did this was with a Ricker model. So the Ricker model is a density dependent population growth and species interaction model. Um, if you've taken intro ecology, it might look familiar, right? You might see this and like, it's ringing some like lots of Volterra bells for you. Um, this is a model that allows us to look at population change over time and relate it to these factors. So the growth rate of your species, the carrying capacity, that's just like the max number, the max population size you can get to, um, the current population size, an interaction index, and the population size of that species that your focal species is interacting with. So this is the Ricker model. Basically what I did is I took this model, I reconfigured it into a linear mixed effects model where I was able to um, solve for the parameters. And then I estimated these parameters here, the intrinsic growth rate and the carrying capacity and this interaction index. So what I'm gonna show now are these population growth curves for these different species. And so what we have are the population size of Ammophila grevilligulata on the x-axis, and then the population size of Ammophila arenaria on the y-axis. And the line I'm showing is this population curve. This is the line for Ammophila arenaria where there would be zero growth for Ammophila arenaria. So what's really cool about these population curves is that you can overlap them on one another. So this is the line for Ammophila arenaria, and we can overlap the line of Ammophila brevilligulata. So here's Ammophila brevilligulata in blue. <laughs> and what you can see, the first thing to notice is that these two lines cross, right? So this is an indication that there's competition happening, there's interactions happening, but there might be like an equilibrium point. There's a point where both of these lines are at, are at zero. So both of these lines indicate that there's no change in the population size for both species. However, this is an unstable equilibrium. And so what that means is that even though there's the crossing of these lines, basically sometimes Ammophila arenaria is going to outcompete Ammophila brevilligulata, and sometimes the opposite will happen, but there's not a scenario where they sort of co-occur in space together. And that like really checks out for what we see on the dunes and has been found in previous bag experiments here at Hatfield. So here's the same figure, but um, the hybrid, the population size of the hybrid is on the x-axis and Ammophila arenaria area is still on the y-axis. And we see a really similar figure. So once again, there's competition happening. There's an unstable equilibrium between these two species. And then finally, this is our um, curve for the hybrid versus Ammophila brevilligulata. So hybrid here is purple with the like super dotted line there. And the important thing is that the hybrid line is sort of above the Ammophila brevilligulata line. And this indicates that the hybrid is always going to outcompete Ammophila brevilligulata, sort of regardless of these starting conditions. So the big takeaway here is that the hybrid often outcompetes Ammophila arenaria, but not always, but always is outcompeting Ammophila brevilligulata in this model. So. Here's the answer to our final goal. The hybrid is outcompeting Ammophila arenaria under most starting densities and Ammophila brevilligulata under all starting densities. So we made it through all of the goals of this experiment and we found that this hybrid is in fact denser, it's heavier, um, it is competing with its parent species, especially with Ammophila brevilligulata. And when we sort of predict those changes over time, we would predict that the hybrid is gonna outcompete Ammophila brevilligulata. So that was sort of our experimental results, but now it's time to take those results back out into the real world, back onto the dunes. So we're gonna go back to these questions that we have as a lab, sort of overall questions as a lab, structuring our research on this hybrid. So the first question was about the abundance and the range limits of the hybrid. And we know that the hybrid is more abundant than we originally anticipated and mostly grows on beaches that are dominated by Ammophila brevilligulata. That understanding that the hybrid is mostly on beaches where Ammophila brevilligulata is the dominant plant, that becomes much more important as we start to think about the results from this study, right? We found that the hybrid grows taller, heavier, and more dense, and that it's competing with its parents, and that it's especially competitive against Ammophila brevilligulata. So the fact that they're co-occurring and that we measured this um, interaction here in the laboratory gives us some sort of striking predictions for what might happen on the coast in Oregon. 
So the next questions that are, you know, our lab is structured around and is interested in are about the genetic and evolutionary effects of the hybrid on its parent species. Um, and we still don't have all of the results for that. And so I'll just say, you should come to my defense in September and I'll tell you a lot more about the potential consequences there. And then the third question is about the effect of the hybrid on the dune system as a whole, right? About the effect of the hybrid on dune shape, carbon sequestration, coastal protection of dunes. And we still need a lot more um, research to happen there. So you should come to Reese's defense in a year <laughs> and learn all about that. Okay, so before I close, we're just gonna take a minute to zoom in again on this abundance and range limits question. I hope that um, I've maybe made the point that there is a hybrid on the dunes in Oregon and Washington that has sort of potentially significant consequences for the shape of the dunes and the ecosystem services that they provide. And so you might be wondering, like maybe we should learn more about what's out there and how much hybrid is out there. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about the way that we're trying to understand the abundance of this grass. And what we're doing is um, we have a partnership with Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition and their Coast Watch program to develop basically a community or citizen science project that is surveying beaches for the Amapola hybrid. And I showed this figure before, but I feel like it's important to return to because um, you might notice from looking at it that there are some gaps. There are some spaces between these little purple dots. And those are not spaces where we've like looked for the hybrid and we just can't find it. Those are places that we just haven't had a chance to look yet. Um, so this is a project with lots of opportunities to be successful in your scavenger hunt. Um, Cause there's lots of parts of the Oregon and Washington coast where we just haven't looked yet. And so the way the program works is we have an iNaturalist site an iNaturalist is just a social network that connects people to nature and generates biodiversity data. And the way it works is you upload photos of any living thing and then other people can identify, can agree or disagree with your identification of the organism that you uploaded. And any beach grass that is identified from California up through BC um, will come straight into this this um, project page that I've built. So the project sort of sucks everything in. You don't have to do anything in iNaturalist. And either I or Risa or somebody else will see whatever observations come in and will agree like, yes, I'm off of Ligulata. Or like, no, that ligula looks too long. Let's check it out. So all you have to do is be a member of iNaturalist and take pictures, especially of the ligules, right? Of that armpit hair, of the grass that happens to be growing out on the beaches. Um, at Hatfield, you might have a fun adventure looking at the grasses here because you actually have both species of beach grass here on campus, which is not normal. Amaphila brevoligulata, the American beach grass, is out of range here. Um, so that could be a fun scavenger hunt for anybody who wanted to go look for it. There should be no hybrid, though. I feel very certain that I pulled it off. <laughs> uh, the project page also has some helpful identification guides. If for some reason you forget how to identify these plants from this talk, you can go onto the, um, the iNaturalist page and find these ID guides that you can pull up on your phone or you can download onto your computer. And there are some opportunities to actually learn how to identify grasses in the wild uh, with Risa and Jesse and myself um, at Sunset Beach State Rec and at Fort Stevens State Park. So these are up in on the North Coast. So you want to come up to the North Coast with us and talk about beach grasses, you are extremely invited. You can ask me or sorry, or Jesse or Risa about that. Okay. So in conclusion, um, the Amophila hybrid is locally abundant. It grows taller, denser, and is heavier, and it aggressively competes with us, its parents, especially with Amophila brevoligulata. And the sort of consequences of that summary of my results are that this hybrid um, might be impacting the grass species composition of dunes. So if we're sort of predicting that the hybrid can outcompete one of its parent species, and we know that it co-occurs with that parent species, leads us to wonder how it's going to spread over time on the beaches in Oregon and Washington. The hybrid might also impact the shape of the dunes, right? I told you that it's growing taller and more densely. Um, and those are two factors that tend to build taller, wider dunes. There are some other 
things about the um, hybrids growth form that add some like question mark, question mark about what kind of dunes it might build over time. But there, if the hybrid does spread, there will absolutely be impacts on dune shape. If dunes change shape, that has effects on coastal protection and on any other ecosystem service of the coast. And then finally, um, the hybrid might be impacting the population genetics of the parent species. So if there's a potential for backcrossing or gene flow through the hybrid, um, we could see changes in the population genetics of these grasses that are already um, extremely dominant in their systems. And any change in which species is dominant would have an effect on these ecosystem services. So with that, um, I have a lot of people to thank, a lot of people who have supported this, this experiment in particular, people from OSU, from Hatfield, um, and then also all of the people who came out and like sprayed sand and got muddy with me throughout the process. Incredible. I also had an incredible group of undergrads who helped me measure grasses. There was a lot of grass measuring that happened for this project. I'm very grateful and extremely grateful to Oregon Sea Grant and the Markham Award. Without that funding, this project could not have happened. So with that, I will close and I would love to take your questions. That was a great presentation. Do we have any questions from uh, folks in here? Hello. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, thanks. For the the morphology you talked about for the hybrid, you said that it it would probably build taller, broader dunes. So yeah. does that mean that we would potentially lose even more beach with the hybrid? It's a really good question. So the reason that I'm thinking about the width of the dunes that the hybrid might build is because I didn't have time to show, but basically I showed you that the number of vertical stems that the hybrid produces is higher than either parent species. The number of lateral stems that it produces is equal to the to one of its parent species, Amophila brevilligulata. Um, so basically it's doing sort of extreme lateral growth and extreme vertical growth, which like is a slightly confusing combination of things. Um, and so that makes us think that it potentially could build these sort of tall dunes that also grow out fairly quickly. It does seem like it was able to take over space within the bags really quickly, which would have to do with that sort of dune growth towards the ocean. But sort of predicting the shape that the dunes are going to be feels really challenging to me at this point. Risa is doing this work where she's going out to patches where the hybrid occurs and resurveying them over time and comparing the shape of the dunes where there's just hybrid to patches of dune on either side where the hybrid doesn't exist. So hopefully from those we'll get a sense of the effect of the hybrid on dune shape and also potentially the way the hybrid might grow sort of towards sort of seaward or vertically over time. Yeah, thanks. Do you have any questions uh, online or, or in? So um, Ralph would like to know if the hybrid has a name. Oh, if the hybrid has a name. That is a great question. So, you know, I came from a, a plant taxonomy, plant systematics background. And so I have these like deeply rooted beliefs about when plants get to be named. Um, and I am, so we're not totally sure whether it deserves to be named yet. Um, yeah, there's some rules about hybridization having to do with like, is it sort of stable in the ecosystem? And when I first started, we were kind of like, mm, doesn't seem like it's gonna, very, there's very much of it. But now after, you know, five years of studying it, it seems like there's a lot of it out there and it might deserve a name. Um, yeah, if you have a fun name, you want to name it, you should let me know. I have come up with a lot of Dune jokes, like Dune the movie, the book jokes that uh, Sally like kind of laughs at, but like doesn't go for. So uh, I think also, I think actually like Medi Ligulata is probably a really good direction to go. So like medium length ligule, boring though. So anyway, yeah, if you have a great name you want to send me, I'll take it. Question? Well, now I have two from the follow-up question from that. So first yeah. I'll ask my follow-up. And so if this hybrid 
can grow both taller and broader, it, it must be better at taking up something, water, nutrients, light. So is anyone in the lab looking at that like physiological level? That's a really good question. So no, no one is looking at the sort of physiological differences between the hybrid and the parents. When I first started, there was somebody interested in doing that and it just, um, it's just challenging. <laughs> they really don't like being grown in greenhouses. Like you have to grow them outside, like don't do very well. And so the physiology stuff is just tricky with them. Um, yeah, but I think you're right. I think one thing to keep in mind is that we do think these are first generation hybrid crosses. So they likely have something called heterosis or hybrid vigor mm -hmm. that we like actually is not deeply understood, but basically often first generations like mules are just bigger and stronger. And so it's, it's likely that we're seeing something like that in the hybrid. So all of them that are out there, each new hybrid is a new cross you, you think good question <laughs> <laughs> tune in next week uh yeah that is a good question um it looks like there are certainly multiple independent hybrid origins and there is also um spread of those hybrids by asexually clonally along the edge but from one site to another yeah well my my original question <laughs> was uh so you showed early in your talk about the um, species richness around mm. Arnaria um, versus Reviliculata yeah. and the differences there. And so is that part of Risa's project is looking at <laughs> species richness <laughs> in the hybrid areas? <laughs> Risa, do you want to do that? Do you want to look at species richness in hybrid patches? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. For the people online, Risa said she is trying to look at um, plant species richness and the effect of the hybrid on plant species richness, but the hybrid patches are really small and they're really dense. And so it can be hard to tell, like we get these zero inflated data sets where it's like, there's only hybrid in here. It can be tricky. That makes sense. All right, yeah. thanks. Thanks. Other questions online? John would like to know, do the roots saturate the soil in the dunes in the similar intensities um, as the experiment? Oh, such a good question. Yeah, so one thing, so the question was about sort of the density of roots that we found in our bags. And I think, you know, dunes have a different sort of thing happening with the way that the water flows through them. And so we can't 100% be like, yes, like dunes are just as full of this mass of roots, like all the way down as our bags are. But in this past year, there was some really dramatic scarping on the dunes. So like big erosion events on the dunes in the Oregon coast. And that gave our lab a chance to like really look at basically like cross sections of dunes. And the density of roots in dunes is truly incredible. Um, yeah, I think it's close to what we're seeing in the bag experiment, even if it's not exactly that. Those dunes, we think of them as these just like piles of sand, but they are just chock full of these plants. Other questions? Just curious from a, a restoration standpoint, yeah. looking at a lot of snowy plover work up and down the coast with state parks, forest service, how is this new hybrid colonizing? Which one's faster at colonizing new open habitat and how easily is it to get rid of in some of this? Yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, so the snowy plover for people less familiar really likes to nest in open sand. And so removal of the beach grasses or at least like really dramatic thinning of the beach grasses, basically like cutting them all down and disking the rhizomes is an important thing to do to open up space for the plovers to nest. Um, yeah, removal of this hybrid, we don't know. And the sort of space occupation of the hybrid, we don't know. From the bag experiment, it seems to me that it's able to take over new sort of open space really quickly. And from what we see in the field, it often grows in these sort of like dense hummocks but it doesn't always. And there are two sites where the hybrid grows across a very, very wide area of dune, like almost the entire face of a dune um, for you know, tens of meters. 
and it grows very sparsely in those places. So we, we really don't know. There, we're seeing patterns in the wild that um, align with kind of really two very, very different ways of understanding it. But um, yeah, it really is only down, it's like we're seeing a lot of it from Fort Stevens area, North Clatsom Plains, all the way. It's very, there's a lot of it in Long Beach, which could be a problem for the plovers up at the end of the peninsula, but they're doing so much there. And then up through Grayland and into Ocean Shores. Any other questions online? Any questions in here? Oh, yes. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Um, I only came in here on like the tail end of your talk, uh, but I still really enjoyed it. So um, you might have already gone over this, but um, what are the factors or factor that stops um, the hybrid from spanning northward or southward from its boundary points? Yeah, great. Yeah, so the hybrid only occurs in places where both parent species occur. Right, so you have to have Ammophila arenaria and Ammophila brevilegulata growing on the same dune together to get the hybrid produced. Um, that's like the production of this hybrid. When we think about its spread over time, it's hard to know what constraints there might be on its spreading. Generally, we find with these beach grasses that it's easier for them to spread north than it is for them to spread south because of the way that the currents in the winter work when they're getting eroded and moved up the coastline. Um, but yeah, I think that would be a constraint on it. But at this point, we're only finding it in areas where the two species both occur. But I think you can probably see the flaw in that logic, right? I am also not looking anywhere else. And so like it would, it would be weird for me to go down onto the South Coast and look for it because there's not both species there. But I'm also not looking there and like no one down there knows what it looks like, right? So. I have a question, Rebecca. So uh, other than erosion, uh, removing some of this, is there a, a other natural uh, processes that reduce dune grass? Natural processes that reduce like the beach grasses, all of them together? Yeah. yeah. That's a great question. I mean, not really. Like sometimes, you know, we think about sort of like, well, maybe there's some predators or something like that, right? Maybe there's some herbivores. I have watched the elk walk along the dunes and preferentially eat the native grass. And they love to eat the like beach pea. But I just, I all I have like one time seen any evidence of grazing on the beach grasses. It really doesn't seem like they're good forage for those kind of animals. Um, I see some like insect damage and some there's like some um, fungal rust stuff that I see on them sometimes, but it doesn't seem to be like a big control. So, uh, so along those lines uh, with this hybridization, are you, have you seen or in your review any other places in the world where you're seeing similar processes of hybridization? And, and historically, are, 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 is there a greater um, uh, hybridization in other areas of the world? Such around? a good question, thank you. Yeah, so both of the two parent species, Ammophila arenaria and Ammophila brevilegulata, in their native ranges, they hybridize with a Calamagrostis species, some other grass species. So in their native ranges, they both hybridize and the European hybrid, so Ammophila arenaria and its Calamagrostis species that it hybridizes with, that plant, that hybrid has been planted on purpose as a dune building grass. So in Europe, there's this long history of planting Ammophila arenaria in order to stabilize sand and build these tall dunes and you know protect dikes, things like that. Um, and this hybrid was actually planted as a sand stabilizer, thinking that it might be a better sand stabilizer than Ammophila arenaria, and it is in some cases. Um, however, there is nowhere else in the world that I know of where both of these species co-occur, where Ammophila arenaria and Ammophila brevilegulata grow on a dune together. They've both been introduced by like, kind of all over the world. They're not just invasive here, they've been planted all over, but they kind of, yeah, one was introduced in one place and one was introduced in the other. And 
never the twain shall meet, except here in Oregon and Washington, where they both were introduced. Yeah, so histories of hybridization in their native ranges, this is probably the only place that they co-occur. West, thank you. No other questions. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. A uh, round of applause for Rebecca, great presentation. Please grab a cookie on the way out. If you did not sign in when you came in, please sign in so that we can uh, basically validate getting cookies every time we have seminars. So thank you. Thank you all.